as I, uh, as I think about it, to imagine that I have talked to a man who was born in 1839. The country was young then. Rupert Blair's grandfather told him stories that illustrate a land and a way of life that would barely change for a century. Uh, he was 80 years old when I was born. I knew him for six years. He, well, he used to tell the kid a lot of things he used to do when he was a boy. The story of Vermont in the 20th century is one of change. But perhaps nowhere did change take place more rapidly and more radically than in a short, narrow valley in the heart of the state, the Mad River Valley. Like many communities in Vermont, the towns of the Mad River Valley were created and defined by a river. The river cut the valley and provided power for its many mills, which supported its agriculture and logging industry for a hundred years. The river gave ice for refrigeration and gravel for roads, and gave residents of the valley somewhere to fish, swim, and skate. Yet, within a single generation, the appearance, the uses, and hence the very identity of the river and the surrounding mountains would change. The economy, the population, and the culture of the valley would be completely transformed. The first European settlers, including Edgar Butterfield's family, arrived in Warren in the 1790s. As in most of Vermont, there were virtually no roads so moving into the valley was an achievement in itself. My ancestors migrated from um, Rolfstown, New Hampshire to, uh, to Warren. They were the 13th settler in the town of Warren. And uh, at the time that they moved there, they had to leave their furniture at what we call Granville now. They called it Codfish Corners when I was a kid. Uh, because there was no road from there into Warren. And uh, they walked into Warren. I think they got their cab uh, log cabin built early part of the winter. And then in the winter, after snow come, the uh, neighbors all got together and they cut a road back down through the woods that they could get down through with oxen and uh, picked up their furniture and brought it up to their log cabin. At first, traveling through Vermont's wilderness was so difficult that it was quicker and easier to ship a wagon by water from where it was made to Burlington and then to lug it piecemeal over the mountains than it was to bring it overland to the valley. When Guy Livingston was a young man, his uncle told him the story of the arrival of the first four-wheeled wagon in the valley around 1840. Uncle lived up, uh, I think they call it Mountain View Farm now, and uh, he's old man up in his 80s, and uh, got talking one day, and he says, uh, said it was his father. It could have been his grandfather, but I think it was his father. He said when he was a young man that he had the first four-wheel uh, wagon in the valley. He had it shipped up from New York to Burlington, and they brought it in as far as they could on the other side of the mountain, as far as any road was concerned. And as far as they would start out, break of dawn, hike over the, what's called a, uh, the gap here, McCullough's Turnpike. Down the other side, he'd strap a, a wheel on his back, or an axle, or something like that, one piece a day, and he'd hike back over the mountain. And when he got back, it'd be dark, sometimes after dark. And he did that until he got it all over here. And uh, it, it took him, I think, a week or 10 days to get it all over. And he had the first four-wheel wagon in the valley. Uh, life was, was pretty hard at least by today's standards. One way of describing it is a story that my, they told on my grandfather, who was a, a teamster. And his main business was taking dairy products from the valley, from Waitsfield, putting them on the train in Middlesex, and then bringing back manufactured goods and whatever it was that he had to have. During the summer, you'd like to get to Middlesex before sunup because you didn't want the butter to get warm and spoil, which meant that you had to get up fairly early in the morning and harness the horses, feed them, come in and have breakfast, hitch them up, and get on the road. My grandfather hired a guy named Glenn Griffith to work for him, and he worked for about three weeks and went over to the store on Saturday night and allowed as to how he had quit working for Cy Smith. And they said, why? Cy Smith is a good person to work for. He's fair. He pays well. And Mr. Griffith said, Cy Smith lied to me. When I went to work for Cy, he promised me steady work. 
and it turned out that there were four hours in the middle of the night I didn't have a damn thing to do. <laughs> the Mad River flowed through the four valley towns, Warren, Waitsfield, Faston, and Moortown, but it wasn't navigable, and it would be a century before Route 100 would make travel easier. Warren was in the far south at the narrow head of the valley. Waitsfield, where the valley opened out a little, providing more river bottom land for agriculture, was slightly more prosperous than Warren. Faston was more a collection of small villages than a town. The wealth of the valley was at the north end, in Moortown, then a lumber town operated by the Ward Lumber Company. Moortown was a typical company town. One employer with two mills, and he had the stores and the post office, and everybody worked for the Ward Lumber Company. Warren, um, we always tended to think of Warren as being not quite as good as Waitsfield somehow. It was, it was rougher, cruder, some, some agriculture, but mostly lumbering. Faston was, was a name only. Uh, you knew people in Faston, but you didn't think of Faston as an entity. And even as today, there is North Faston, Center Faston, and South Faston. In years ago, when we first came here, I mean, Moortown was the, so, the rich town. I mean, it had all the lumber mills. It had everything in Warren and Faston, and uh, especially Warren and Faston was really the poorest, the poorest of the poor towns. Residents of Warren, which was virtually a frontier logging and mill town, could easily feel inferior to their more civilized neighbors downstream. Uh, Waitsfield always looked upon us, and I, I don't mean to argue in any manner. It doesn't look that way to me. I didn't really, don't really care. But uh, they were the center of town, and they were the elite. They, 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 were the, they were the center. And the rough old farmers and woodcutters and, and things uh, came from the surrounding area, came from the hills. And uh, there was a time when the uh, International Paper Company was, was cutting the logs off what is now government land. Well, the, the loggers had a rough life, and they were inclined to live a little rough. But uh, if you stay in and work in the lumber camp all winter, if you come out in the spring, you no strange thing, you might be a little rowdy. In this small valley of loggers and farmers lived people from several different cultures. Didn't realize it at the time, there were probably three cultures, at least. There was the uh, Protestant, it was separated by religion as much as anything else. Uh, the major lights in town, the, the merchant class, the, uh, the professional class, generally tended to be members of the, of the Protestant church. My family, descended from Irish in, immigrants, not very far, came to uh, my mother's family, used to live on what was known as Paddy Hill in Moortown, where there were a whole collection of Flanagans and Karens and Flynns and all of those people. And then there were the French Canadians, of whom there were a, a large number in, in town, and they tended to be Catholic. So there were these three cultures, uh, which I didn't recognize at the time, did you? Mm -mm. Uh, they were just neighbors and people and classmates. Mm-hmm. Some of them ate a little more differently than others. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the foods were different. Uh, yes, you had your famous blood pudding. Oh, blood sausage, yes, blood at sausage. Christmas time. <laughs> Absolutely. Had to have that. Had to have that. The people used every part of the animal that they, that they could. And your father was a fan of, of head, head sausage, head, head cheese. cheese, yeah. When your mother told me the story when she was a little girl that she was cleaning the intestines in the Mad River, that was just, ugh, <laughs> <laughs> for her blood sausage. you got to have it for sausage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Blood sausage is uh, largely a concoction of cornmeal, salt pork, spices, and uh, coagulated blood, which you literally catch from, from the pigs as they are slaughtered. And it's treated carefully. It, it is an Irish tradition, uh, always served for breakfast on Christmas Day. It's the only time we had it. I can understand why. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, doesn't that sound tasty? Rupert Blair, Edgar Butterfield, Guy Livingston, Jack Smith, 
Spike Vassar and Judy Smith are present and past residents of Vermont's Mad River Valley. The interviews were recorded by Miles B. Smith. This series was produced for the Vermont Folklife Center Middlebury by Jane Beck and Ev Grimes. Funding was provided by the Friends of the Mad River and the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Fund. I'm Greg Sharrow. Somebody asked me how the Depression hit you folks up here in Vermont. It's been scarcely noticed it. Everything was always so hard to make a living up here. We, we never noticed the Depression until some of the fellows came up from down the country and told us there was one going on. Living in a small mountainous valley helped to foster the hard-working self-sufficiency that saw the residents of the Mad River Valley through the Depression. It largely insulated them from the economic turmoil of the rest of the country at that time. The isolation, though, brought daily inconvenience and hardship. Electricity, for example, like paved roads and motor vehicles, came late to the Mad River Valley, and even then it often went into the barns to run lights and milking machines before it came into the houses. When electricity did arrive, it illuminated a larger world. Until then, the valley and its residents were isolated like the pools of light thrown by individual lanterns. My grandfather had a, the old subsistence farm up on the hill where you had three or four cows, an ox or two, maybe a driving horse, pigs, sheep. They, they had everything that they needed for existence. You raised your potatoes, you raised their own grain to, to feed the horse. You, don't have to, you didn't have to buy any, uh, any gasoline or diesel fuel. He had a big vegetable garden. He did sell a few logs. They, they cut off the land and skid it down with old logs, probably. Sugared a little. Everybody had hands. I, I remember my mother always used to figure on having 25 hands. Really wasn't much more you needed. So it was actually we self-sufficient, which as I can best determine that that was uh, the typical way of living in Vermont at that time. Uh, it's more a bartering uh, community or a bartering way of life than it was uh, a cash way of life. Uh, I was born and brought up on... Uh, the area in Warren that was known as Grand Hollow. Presently, it's been renamed Sugarbush. And, uh, of course, uh, that was a time of lanterns and lamps, not electricity. And it was always the uh, Saturday that we washed the lantern globes in the, in the chimneys to the lamps and filled them with kerosene. And wash day was on Monday. We didn't have no electricity, and I had to wash my hand. And that was an all-day's job. I used to take and put double boiler, a uh, uh, copper boiler on the stove, and this there was a reservoir on the stove. You fill that up with water, you fill that copper boiler up with water, and you had to heat it before you could wash, and then it was all day long. And in those days, those boys wore white shirts to school. Not like they have now, all the colored ones. That would have been so much easier, but pure white. And we had these flat irons that you heat on the stove to iron with, and we call them sand irons. They weren't two sand irons. <laughs> And when you'd get them on the wrong place in the stove where the griddle would come, they would be smoking and you'd get a black spot on the shirt and have to take it and wash it again. So you see why it was all this job to wash. I remember once what my brother had uh, was just a wee baby. And I remember... Mother had been ironing, and and my brother needed his diapers changed, and Mother put him up on the ironing board. And I remember Graham Woodard having an absolute fit because that meant a death in the family. And she went off into the sitting room, as they call it, and she didn't want to see my brother up there on that ironing board. Sunday was a day of rest. Uh, nothing took place except those things that absolutely had to be done. And 
the means of communication were horse and buggy or horse and sleigh, sometimes various big sleds. It's all depending. We had express wagons. We had wa uh, lumber wagons to carry on uh, whatever we had to do. I, I look back on it. I think of a lot of, a lot of good times I had. Like, uh, I went courted my wife on snowshoes. He, he uh, said the roads were impassable. She lived down, uh, she was boarding down uh, on the top of Pike Hill. She taught school up to East Warren and boarded down there. And, uh, no way I'd get a car through. They didn't plow the roads then in 37, 38. So I, I went courting on snowshoes. We didn't get electricity here until 1946. We had the, the carbide gas lights, I think we put them then in 39, which were, well, an improvement, considerable improvement. But I, I spent a good many hours uh, sitting under a cow with a kerosene lantern hanging up on a, on a post in the barn. I am not sure, but there is a, a post down there in the barn now with a, with a nail in it where we used to hang the lantern. Everywhere we went, you took a lantern with you. We got electricity when my sister got married. I, it was something like 47 years ago. Uh, and I can remember uh, the poles being put up the hill and put in the middle of your fields, but we didn't complain at all. We were just so happy to get electricity. Up until then, it was just kerosene. We used to milk cows by hand with kerosene lanterns for light. And why we're not all blind is beyond me. It, uh, sit around one kerosene lamp and do our homework or read and uh, then electricity came and uh, you know, we got milking machines and and it all started uh, for, for we were probably much later getting electricity than most people because we were up this hill so far one gentleman that i get a big kick out of uh, lived up on lincoln mountain road and a friend of mine was an electrician he went up and wired his house and hitched it up and, oh, that was wonderful. And one afternoon, uh, he called up the electrician and he said, uh, I wish you'd come up, Joe. He said, uh, one of my lights don't work. And Joe said, well, maybe you ought to put in a new bulb. Well, for gosh sakes, he said, you mean that's all there is to it? And Joe had it quite a time explaining to him. He had to screw one out and screw another one in. Cause, you know, that was how new it was to him, you know. Uh -uh. Rupert Blair, Ed Irish, Bertha Tucker, Alice DeLong, Spike Vassar, and Alden Bettis are residents of Vermont's Mad River Valley. The interviews were recorded by Miles B. Smith. This series was produced for the Vermont Folklife Center, Middlebury, by Jane Beck and Ev Grimes. Funding was provided by the Friends of the Mad River and the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Fund. I'm Greg Shero. I think about the times that uh, I'm going to school it was two and a half miles from where we live to the schoolhouse. And we walked all the time to school. And we'd get up early in the morning and leave about 7.30, uh, because when I, school began at 9. And we had to get there to start the fire. Well, you can imagine the cold room and starting those fires up. Nowadays, children expect to take a bus to a warm schoolroom, and we expect children to study and play with friends of their own age. Until 40 or 50 years ago, though, because of the geography and the difficulty of transportation, the four small towns of the Mad River Valley were isolated communities centered around one-room schoolhouses and around activities that involved people of all ages and of many backgrounds, among them Scots, Irish, English, German, and a few French families. Basically, at the Faston School, we were the only French family. Schools threw everyone together, even if some of the French families still spoke little English. Uh, some of the younger of us uh, could speak some, but my older brothers uh, couldn't hardly speak a word of English. And, uh, and so the first couple of years of school was, were not easy for us. Uh, and not only were they not easy because the language was different but because we couldn't afford the, the long pants and we probably wore knickers longer than most kids did and although in those days all kids were farm kids and there wasn't really any discrimination against somebody who was poor we were all poor with eight grades in one room 
The schools were Spartan, and the teachers, often barely older than the oldest pupils, were on their own. That was my very first day of teaching. Up there in that rural school, and, and it was that long drawer in the front of the desk. I don't know what hovering angel was straddled my neck, but I happened to open the drawer just a little bit, and there was this snake's head popped out. Well, I knew instantly what had happened. I'm not too sure about what I'd have done it myself back <laughs> my heyday, but I just shut the drawer and said nothing. But after school, I had two big boys in the upper grades. Of course, I had all eight grades and probably eight grades in between. And the windows were all open because, of course, it's September. And no screens on the doors or windows or anything. And the flies thick. And so I asked these two boys if they just wouldn't stay after school. And they looked at each other. They wondered. And I said it in just the nicest voice I could muster up. And so I wadded up some paper in the waste paper basket Asked them if they'd swat some flies, and I let them swat flies for a few minutes. And and then I said, well, I, said, I don't know how many for you to swat. I says, I don't know if the snake will even eat them, but I says, I can't stand it to have that snake there in that desk drawer without anything to eat. That's all I said. That's all I had to say. I never had another snake. In there. Out of school, children still entertain themselves in groups or in families. Winter sports equipment may have been in its infancy, but there was always the Travis, a long, narrow sled mounted on two pairs of runners that could carry several passengers sitting one behind each other. They used to have sliding parties in the winter, and uh, Raymond, one of the older boys, uh, he would hitch up his team on a, on a sled and meet us at the foot of the hill, and he'd put bells on the horses. It sounded like Christmas year-round, and he'd haul the sled behind the team of horses and we'd ride in the sled back up top of the hill and take another ride and go to somebody's home and have hot chocolate or after the sliding parties and that's the way we spent our, our Saturday nights maybe Sunday Sunday nights we'd do that instead of going to town or anything else it was probably sometimes 15 or 20 couples three pair of Travis's sliding down the hills Cheap fun. Uh, Harold Parker, he ran the store down in Warren Village. He used to come up and uh, visit one of my neighbors, Frank Turner, up on the hill next to us there. And he came down by about the time my aunt had asked me to go down the street and pick up some something, make a cake or some doggone thing. And I see Harold, and I said, uh, Harold, uh, wouldn't you like a ride? Well, no, he didn't think he wanted I said, come on, don't be chicken. I... I I may shake you up a little bit, but I, I won't kill you. So he got way on the back end of the Travis, and we took off. For a while, he kept his feet up, and then after a while, we made a couple of fast bends there, and he got a little shook up. So he had on a brand fired new pair of five-buckle overshoes. He started dragging those. He never took them off the road till we pulled in to the last bend down by the bridge, which we come pretty close to every time. And I swear, when he got off in those Travis's, there was smoke coming out of the bottom of those shoes. And he said that he would never, never ride with me again on those Travis's. <laughs> he said that was one of the worst rides he ever took in his life. Well, I didn't think that was appreciating a nice trip. I'd done it time and time. I enjoyed it. Of course, we almost hit the bridge every time. But uh, uh, that was... You know, when you're young, you got to have something for a thrill, and that's about the only way we had. <laughs> but we had lots of fun in the wintertime skiing. We skied differently than we do now. We, the skis were made locally, and we skied in the open open fields, and we made jumps, but the, the, the skis were not, they didn't have bindings or anything. They were just a strap that you chuck your toes in, and... Sometimes you lost your skis and they'd take off through the field and you'd have to go get them, chase them. I used to ski on logging roads when people were logging back on the hillside. Just take my skis and ski down while they dragged the logs down. It was easy to control them then. Cause they were just sticks with straps in the middle. You didn't have much control over them in those days. 
but it was fun. A lot of the entertainment took place indoors, often involving kitchen junkets at one family's house or another's. Of course, back then we didn't have radios, so we, to have any fun, we had to make our own music. I guess I started when I was about nine, eight or nine, playing, trying to play second violin with my older brother. My brother and I and my sister played. Dad and mother played before us. Dad played organ, trumpet, and mother played the violin. My brother took over from them, and I, my sister played organ and accordion. So we had a little extra your own family, and we played to these kitchen junkets. Each neighbor would, they shipped off. Saturday nights, one would have it, and next week another one. But there's always one having many, many more than, than the others. But they uh, had a good, good, we call it supper, call it dinner or lunch, whatever you want, about midnight at every place. I, uh, to give you an example of one, one place we went to, uh, Wilbur Larrell. He brought in the separation, the cream from the separation, that whole night's dairy. Whole bucket of cream for coffee, and uh, that's the way they were. So that was uh, the days of kitchen junkets, and I guess the last I went to was about 1930. Good memories. Ed Irish, Spike Vassar, Alice DeLong, Jack Laro, Alden Bettis, and Earl Long are present and past residents of Vermont's Mad River Valley. The interviews were recorded by Miles B. Smith. This series was produced for the Vermont Folklife Center Middlebury by Jane Beck and Ev Grimes. Funding was provided by the Friends of the Mad River and the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Fund. I'm Greg Sharrow. I can remember lots of times when I was a kid listening to the uh, teams going up by in the winter time. It'd be anywhere from five, six, or seven, about four o'clock in the morning. And of course, each one had a different bell, so you could tell who's who. Until about 50 years ago, when the sawmills could no longer compete with cheaper wood coming in from the west coast in Canada, logging by horse and sled was a vital industry in the Mad River Valley. And I remember sleeping upstairs and listening about four o'clock and hearing those teams go up by with the bells dinging along and of course you could hear the squeaking of the runners of course it was cold and they'd go up and uh, get faced and load up with their logs and then about four or five o'clock they would come back unload their logs at the mill put up their horses and uh, then put up for the night and be ready for the next morning to back go back up and get another load of logs and of course everything was, those days were brought in in the winter time. They had huge piles of logs so that they could saw them in the spring of the year when there was plenty of water and also some during the summer. The International Paper Company came to Granville in Granville Woods and they took a million feet of spruce from those mountains three years running. And my older brother worked there, and my brother-in-law went down with his team, and Irvin Jones went with his, and Wilbur Laurel. And when they were gone uh, down there, of course, they stayed overnight, and the women took care of the dairies. My oldest sister took care of, of the cattle at Ralph and her farm, and Mary Laurel took care of the cattle. And at that time, their children were too small to help any. So the women really took over, and, and the men tried to earn what they could. The lumber companies set up logging camps in the hills above the valley. It wasn't an easy life. They had a lot of, of uh, lumberjacks that stayed right there. And they had a boarding house and everything. Oh, they used to come into town Saturday night. We had what they called a pung sleigh, and they could get many people in it. And my older brother, who was probably about 14 years old, he had to go to over to the logging camp 
and pick up the lumberjacks and bring them in. And they had, they traded a lot. But my father always had a barrel of Jamaica ginger every Saturday for the lumberjacks. And they would put it right down. I think they would burn their stomach out because it was awful strong stuff. And then about midnight, my brother used to have to go take them back to the lumber camp and come home. It was quite a feat for a boy that age, but he did it. <laughs> the work in winter may have been bitterly cold, but at least the frozen ground made it easy to skid logs out of the woods. In spring, everything changed. If you survived the winter, then the next thing you had was a confounded mud. And uh, I remember up in front of Orrin Lovett's, just above Pike Hill, I got into the mud there one, one morning, and uh, I lost the truck clear down to the driver's. That night we went up with the old farm all tractor, and the uh, loading bed on the back of the truck was was just level with the road. You couldn't even see the rear wheels. We had to play woodchuck to, yeah, we had you had we had to dig for oh, probably a half an hour to get down to the frame of the truck where we could hitch a chain onto the tractor and not uh, pull the truck apart. But that was just an example of some of the roads we had back in those days. It wasn't unusual to get stuck anywhere five to six times just coming from uh, Warren Village out through to Waitsfield Village. And at that time, trucks, you see, that was in the 30s and early 40s, and trucks were beginning to come in and horses were going out as far as uh, big teams of work horses around the mill yards and... Uh, you know, hauling lumber uh, trucks were pretty well. We used to ship quite a lot of lumber by rail out of Middlesex, and that was trucks then. But still, we had about eight teams of horses, but there was, a, there was competition and friction between the truckers, the trucks, and the horses. And in the mill yards, which were really quagmires and just knee-deep mud in the spring, the trucks would get down in there to load lumber, which was all loaded by hand, and uh, this is all hardwood lumber, heavy, and you know, they'd, they'd put on the load of lumber, and then they couldn't get out, and they'd try. And then the teams which worked around the mill yards would have to come, and they'd hook on one or two or three teams, and the teamsters would get on the side, and they'd pull the trucks that were loaded out, and that was just so exciting because... The Teamsters were so proud that the truck couldn't get out without the teams helping them get out. Otis Wallace, Bob Gove, Florence Gould, Alden Bettis, and Holly Ward are present and past residents of Vermont's Mad River Valley. The interviews were recorded by Miles B. Smith. This series was produced for the Vermont Folklife Center, Middlebury, by Jane Beck and Ev Grimes. Funding was provided by the Friends of the Mad River and the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Fund. I'm Greg Sherrill. I always now, at this time, remember how the river, what an important part the river played in, in all of our lives and me as a small child or as a young boy uh, because... Moortown was really a lumber town uh, with a few farms on the hills, but it was primarily a, a lumber town, and everyone depended on the mills operating for work. Like many communities in Vermont, the towns in the Mad River Valley were defined by a river. It gave residents of the valley a place for fishing, swimming, and skating. The river gave gravel for roads and ice for refrigeration. It provided power for the mills, including grist mills, cider mills, a butter tub factory, and sawmills. The sawmills cut wood to build homes and established the foundation for a logging economy. All of the, the mills at one time when they started were water powered. Uh, the Mad River 
falls fairly fast. It, uh, it has a fairly steep gradient from one end to the other, and there were lots of dams, including one out here right behind the barn. Of course, there was Ward's Mill down there in Moortown. There was two mills going. The lumber mills, and both of them were lumber mills. One of them was a kind of a chair stock mill. And also there was another one, the Clybrid Mill, which is still going, existing now. And um, of course, there was years ago, there was quite a lot of mills up in Warren. And uh, most everybody was employed in, in the mill. If they weren't farming, they were employed in the mill. But Warren used to be a beautiful village. We had four or five mills. There was four dams on the river. The fishing was better then than it is now. Swimming was better. You could used to dive off the, the roof of the covered bridge. That's when they let them take the gravel out of the river. They uh, got gravel out of the river, which was a good thing. And uh, they'd gravel the roads. Mm -hmm. They'd beat uh, several teams. And then they'd have probably anywhere from eight or ten men down in the, in the river, uh, shoveling the gravel into the uh, wagons. And then the people would haul that, and then they'd go to the road. Yeah, most everything was done for the town was uh, done by the farmers that would work. Uh, they didn't get very big pay. Uh, so anyway, the water played an important part in the economy of Moortown Village. Uh, but it was also a great source of recreation for everybody, adults and children. It seems like in the winter time, when things were right, once the river got frozen and everything worked right as far as the snow conditions, that we skated like every night on the river, on the Mad River. We used to skate night after night. Always had a big fire, big bonfire. We used to play hockey, and I mean, it was just a social time. The adults skated, and everybody skated on weekends. Everybody skated. Of course, when I was a child, several of us uh, used to trap muskrat in the river. That was a big thing. We used to, I don't know that we ever caught a lot. Well, we used to catch a few at that, but that was always a very exciting thing to do. And uh, so we would do that, and we had a few boats that we played around the river on. Oh, and during the winter, of course, you'd have to cut ice because there was no mechanical refrigeration available, and uh, everybody put up ice which was a cold, <laughs> cold way to go. But it was cash money as far as, as my dad was concerned. We had had a setback from the dam out here in, in the meadow and uh, generally cut that over two and sometimes three times a year and deliver ice. Uh, in the summertime, the water would build up in the evening and overnight and once it had built up to the top of the dam, because the water was mill ponds, it set back for quite a long ways, and the water was stored. So the men would come to work like at 3 o'clock in the morning. Once the dam was full, they wanted to be able to utilize it, so they would come to work like at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, and they would run the mill until 7 or 8 o'clock, and they would have used up all the water that had collected in the dam and there wasn't enough flow to keep it going. So then they would go home and the water would store up again. They'd wait four or five hours and they would come back and that's how they lived and, and worked off the water power. And I'm sure that worked with all dams all around New England probably. Of course, the river isn't always benign. Flooding is still common. People still remember the famous flood of 1927, which destroyed bridges and mills all over the state swept away houses and cattle, and drowned nearly a hundred people, including Vermont's lieutenant governor. I guess the other thing I can remember about the river is that everybody was a little afraid of it, because it, it could be, I mean, we had a few substantial floods, and I don't remember the 27 flood, but it was always imprinted in my memory. I do remember the hurricane of 1938, and then the water was in the middle part and lower northerly part of the village, the water was well up in the houses. So uh, you had a lot of respect for the, for the river uh, and what it was going to do. 
Even after the arrival of electricity, the river still dictated the rhythms of activity in the valley. Later on, when I can remember more, it was a little more my time, uh, auxiliary power came in. But it was always the river that, even then with the auxiliary power, it was always the river that decided how things were going and uh, was it going to be possible in the springtime when the ice went out the dams would get these great ice jams. I can remember more than once uh, at a big dam at the lower mill where the clapboard mill is now, but it was the mill, the dam is no longer there. I can remember watching the men go out. One in particular would go out in the, and, and the water would get so that, or the dam would cause the ice to jam and set back and people say, oh, it's gonna flood the, the Moortown village. So these guys would go out, one in particular, and he had this big auger, big bit, and he'd stand there out with all the water and the ice sort of around. I mean, anything could have happened at any time. And he'd casually bore maybe a, like a two-inch hole down in these great huge blocks of ice and put dynamite in, and then they'd run their fuse over and... I can remember standing there watching this and they'd blast the ice so that it could go and let the ice move on so they didn't come back and flood the town. That was pretty exciting for anybody and pretty dangerous for the people that did it, although I never knew anybody to get hurt doing that. Holly Ward, Jack Smith, Otis Wallace, and Rupert Blair are present and past residents of Vermont's Mad River Valley. The interviews were recorded by Miles B. Smith. This series was produced for the Vermont Folklife Center, Middlebury, by Jane Beck and Ev Grimes. Funding was provided by the Friends of the Mad River and the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Fund. I'm Greg Sharrow. In 1876, after the uh, telephone was invented, there was an exposition in New York, and at that time, um, a lot of people made their own phones, and so there were a lot of phone companies started. Uh, the Waitsfield Faceton Telephone Company was actually started uh, three or four years before it was incorporated uh, by people who just wanted to communicate better and uh, and have the latest toy going. So about 20 people incorporated in 1904 under the state legislature. The uh, number of customers way back was in, in the 1905 telephone directory was about 30. The telephone was brought into the Mad River Valley not just as a profitable business enterprise but to meet a remarkable variety of needs. And once in place, it played more roles in the community than its inventor could have dreamed of. Back in the early days, well, actually the entire time that we were magneto or cranked phones, um, people would use the telephone company for announcements, uh, a bake sale at the church or something going on, and also for fire. And they were distinguished by the number of rings. If it was a notice, it was two short rings three times, and if it was a fire, it was three short rings three times. And the operators would actually plug into more than one line and give the notice so that she could give the whole system. If there was a fire, she had to know what lines were in what town to call out the, the voluntary firemen. And of course, because the office was right in the center of Waysville Village and the doctor wasn't far away, if anybody called for the doctor or called for Mrs. Jones, um, the operator more than likely would know if she'd seen her. So she'd say, oh, she's not home right now. I just saw her go into the grocery store. or I just saw the doctor go off toward Moortown. Um, so the telephone company was really a, a public service more than just the utility. You step up there and 
take your receiver off and wind that old crank and and then the operator would come on and you'd tell her what number she want and she'd plug in that switch and tweet, 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 tweet. Well, was, that course came in. We had telephone up on West Hill long before we had electricity. The telephone office, the business office, was always in our home. Uh, the central office or the switchboard was in a different location. But um, because it was in our home, actually, what is now our living room, people would come in and talk, visit. I can remember one lady coming and uh, staying most all morning, and then she would sit on the radiator by the door, and when it was almost time for her to go home to get the kids lunch when they would be coming home from school, she'd get up and say, well, I guess I've got to go home. And then she'd sit back down again and talk some more. So it was, it was kind of the social hub of Waitsfield. Um, of course, you knew everybody because it was a small community. But even more than that, um, it was um, a very personable kind of relationship you had with people. Very early when my father was running the company, people didn't have money. Um, they would trade service for products. He would get wood ashes for his garden, maple syrup, eggs, chickens, half a pig, anything that would pay the bill. And I think this was pretty typical of small companies way back in the beginning. We're talking about back in the 1910s and 20s. Telephone lines were much different than they are today, and it was our responsibility, each patron had to maintain uh, the telephone line from their property to the, to the next property. Uh, another thing very interesting about these telephone lines was the fact that uh, uh, you, you had about uh, oh, anywhere from six or eight up to the teens of patrons on the same line, and each had a number. Well, each number that was uh, rung on the, uh, on the line, uh, you could hear. There was a lot of people, and as there we was talking about the news, uh, they were ready to find out whatever happened, so you'd always hear click, 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 the different people picking up the receivers to see what was going on. One of the customers stole a voice in North Face and became very famous because she wasn't very well, and she sat in her chair next to the window, uh, next to a clock, and so any time that Stella was listening, and they used to call it rubbering on the line, uh, people would say, good morning, Stella, because they could hear her clock ticking. When the um, telephone company moved from within the house, we had a sun porch, and the sun porch was converted to a business office uh, with two desks. Uh, there were people who came to the business office to do business who were quite famous. Gene Rayburn, for example, had a place up in East Warren. He came in one day in a raccoon fur coat, looked around and he said, oh, the Back Porch Telephone Company. And from then on, that's what we were known as, at least until we built our business office in 1966. At the time we converted to dial in 1961, there were 325 customers. Before that, there had actually been more because of a lot of um, logging in Faston. But then there had been a sharp drop at uh, some time during the 20s. So there were 325 customers who converted to uh, dial in 1961. And the reason there was a push to convert to dial was the beginning of Sugarbush. Naturally, they didn't want to be on a party line and there were party lines with over 20 people. They couldn't do business that way. So that really saw a sharp increase from 1961 until the end of the 70s. Uh, we would do what was supposed to be a 10-year plan, and the 10-year plan never went more than five years because of all the growth. The growth and profitability of the telephone, though, has led to the near disappearance of most of the small local phone companies that connected a handful of people. There were a lot of independents in the state because for the very reasons that Waitsfield Faston was formed, um, small companies were formed. There was one in Franklin that was formed because the man who was selling the grain wanted to know when the train arrived at the siding. And if it was late, he didn't want to go down and wait. 
there was one town in Vermont where a doctor put in a phone system so that he could stay in touch with his patients and not have to go out in the mud and wind and snow and ice to see his patients. Today, there are only four truly independent companies left in the state of Vermont. But uh, the four of us who are left are strong, viable, independent phone companies providing the newest in technology. They tell the story about uh, uh, Clarence Strong of how uh, early one morning he wanted to use the line and he went to the phone and there were two ladies uh, talking and one of them said she just made these cookies and put them in her oven. And uh, well, he went about his work and he came back uh, 10 minutes or so later and they were still on talking. So he went back to work again and, and came back and they were still on the phone. Well, he got pretty well upset and he just about exhausted himself and he finally he uh, heard them and he went to, in the phone and he s snuffed a little like that and he says, I smell something burning. And this lady says, oh my land, I says, my cookies may be burning in my oven. Eleanor Haskins, Alden Bettis, and Ed Irish are residents of Vermont's Mad River Valley. The interviews were recorded by Miles B. Smith. This series was produced for the Vermont Folklife Center, Middlebury, by Jane Beck and Ev Grimes. Funding was provided by the Friends of the Mad River and the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Fund. I'm Greg Shero. I joke about there being the only thing there was here is popple trees and poverty. And uh, it was a whole community of farms, uh, small, little bitty farms that uh, you eked out a sort of an existence. and. Uh, and as the years progressed, uh, people left the farm and, and they went on to regular type jobs. Uh, and uh, in this area, we were we were fortunate that uh, maybe we had the mountains that people wanted to ski off from. And if it wasn't for Sugarbush Valley and uh, or Sugarbush Ski Area and Mad River, they came here and Mad River came in 1947, I believe. Uh, we would still be popple trees in poverty. The story of Vermont in the 20th century is one of change. But perhaps nowhere did change take place more rapidly and more radically than in a short, narrow valley in the heart of the state, the Mad River Valley. And if one factor promoted this transformation more than any others, it was the arrival of the ski areas. Roland Palmetto from New York started work on the first ski area in the valley, Mad River Glen, in 1947, and Damon Gadd, whose family had made money in Hawaii from pineapples, opened Sugarbush in 1959 with the help of such hardy souls as Lixie Fortna from Austria. We worked uh, at least 10 hours a day. We worked till the work was done. Of course, there was nothing up here. Damon Gadd and his general manager, Jack Murphy, whom he had hired from Mad River, laid out the trails and ordered the lifts, and the workmen came in and cut the trails. There were no buildings around here at all, so uh, our office was the superstructure of an old army telephone truck. There was no electricity. We worked by, well, daylight if there was any, and then later on by flashlight. Uh, there was a jerry-rigged telephone, in those days, it was a crank phone. It was a party line. You couldn't always get it when you wanted it. And we did a lot of business with Italy because all the um, lifts and lift parts came from Italy. And that was quite a feat to talk long distance like that on that telephone. In the early days, the valley had no hotels or restaurants for the skiers. So neighbors and their friends opened up their homes and created makeshift dorms. She said, you know what I think I'm going to do? And I said, no, what you going to do? She said, I think I want to take skiers. And she said, you can do the cooking. And I said, uh, yeah, but I said, I don't know how much. <laughs> and, and she didn't either, as far as that was concerned. She didn't know. We were greenhorns at it. 
but we started anyway, and we just had a few at first, and then we had a lot. We have as many as a hundred because they had dorms out there in toward the barn, and uh, they had the, that uh, part of the barn they fixed into dorm spaces, and. Uh, I used to make 16 loaves of bread every day when we had skiers. So it, it wasn't so bad, you know, once you get used to it. And of course, Dorothy's mother had a big family. And Dorothy knew what it was like to, you know, to feed a lot of kids and things. And so, and of course, I, I cooked myself so that. I do, <laughs> and a lot of things, and I said to her, I said, we can have pie, providing you haven't more than 50, and if you got more than 50, we can have cake, <laughs> or, or pudding or something, you know, because <laughs> a lot of times we made chocolate pie, and, and then had whipped cream with it, and of course, those skiers love that. And some of them would come down and, and they'd say after the supper was over, they'd say, is there any more pie left? <laughs> and of course, that was, never was. And I said to one of the young fellows, I said, I suppose your mother's a good cook. He said, she can cook water. <laughs> oh, they loved her home cooking. The slopes themselves were also run in something of a labor-intensive fashion. Machine grooming didn't reach the ski areas until the 1960s, and it wasn't unusual for high school students to be hired to pack down the snow on the ski slopes by sidestepping up the mountain on their skis. Failing that, the snow was simply shoveled flat, giving rise to one winter sport at which the locals could beat the visitors. In the winter time, when the boys was working on the mountain up there, See, they had to do a lot of the grooming on the trails by hand, and they used scoop shovels. So when they got ready to come back and come down the mountain, they'd jump onto the, sit on the uh, scoop and hang onto the, the handle, and they'd, they'd really come down through there. They'd go by the skiers sometimes. <laughs> the first ski instructor was um, Peter Esten, who was a socialite from New York, and he brought in what was called the jet set in those days, all the beautiful people. And very quickly, the mountain got the nickname Mascara Mountain. Residents of the valley were not accustomed to outsiders of any kind, especially wealthy outsiders who came from cities. Maybe I was having a bad day, but I think as I remember, I had worked about a 26 or 28 hour shift and just getting ready to put a piece of equipment in the garage and come home. This guy come over and I had the garage doors open, ready to back the machine. He said he was stuck in a ditch over there. Would I come over and pull him out? So I went over there and I said, the chain's in the back of the machine. He didn't even get out to hook it, get the chain out and hitch it on a vehicle or anything because that's what we like to have somebody doing, and if you damage the vehicles, uh, put on, hitched onto something that broke off, and they couldn't blame you. He didn't do that, so I climbed out and got the chain. All this time, I was getting a little concerned. So I pulled him back about six or eight feet. And he walked over and he said, "Well, thanks a lot." And I said, "Thank you. Don't pay Mad Rivers bills." And he said. You didn't think I was going to pay anything, did you? I said, no. So I got in the machine and pushed the thing back in where it was and went back over to the garage and put the machine in and locked the door. Came home. Early on, there was a lot of uh, feeling about these city slickers who came up here. A lot of feeling. And Mad River, in an attempt to show people that it really did make a difference, paid in silver, in silver dollars and so residents in the valley could see where those dollars went. Uh, the trickle down from that was very obvious and I think really showed us, gave us quite a lesson. There really isn't anything else that you could do here. So I guess it, it really does 
irk me when you hear these people say, I wish Sugar Bush was gone. Uh, uh, no, they don't. <laughs> because we went through that once before they came, and it, it, there was just poverty here. Between 1960 and 1980, the population of the Mad River Valley doubled. By 1973, 46% of real estate taxes in Faston came from vacation or seasonal homes. Between 1957 and 1976, the number of places offering accommodation in Waitsfield and Warren rose from 5 to 33, restaurants from 2 to 19. Skiing brought new jobs to the valley and also a new kind of inhabitant. We had a wonderful institution in the old days, and they were called ski bums. They were young people, male and female, that um, loved to ski, and they, most of them took a year or two out of uh, college or before college, and they would uh, come up here and they would do any work that was necessary in the lodges or in the restaurants or at the ski area, and they would get paid by means of a ski pass, which was in those days $95 for the season for a ski bum. And uh, so they, they worked as maybe waiters in the morning and at night, and the rest of the time they were out skiing or they did some office work or something. They were young people that were very happy. A great number of them uh, settled in the valley. They got married, they settled there, the young families of the valley now. Spike Vassar, Lixie Fortna, Bertha Tucker, Alden Bettis, Jack Laro, and Eleanor Haskins are present and past residents of Vermont's Mad River Valley. The interviews were recorded by Miles B. Smith. This series was produced for the Vermont Folklife Center, Middlebury, by Jane Beck and Ev Grimes. Funding was provided by the Friends of the Mad River and the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Fund. I'm Greg Sharrow. I can't imagine any any greater change occurring than has occurred in the in the last 40 years. I can't see how it could. I would be frightened if I thought it might. The story of Vermont in the 20th century is one of change, but perhaps nowhere did change take place more rapidly and more radically than in a short, narrow valley in the heart of the state, the Mad River Valley. Within barely more than a generation, the valley saw the change from lantern to electric light, from outhouse to indoor plumbing, from horse and buggy to paved roads and cars. Each change, though, seemed to demand more changes, as was reflected in the life of one Vermont farmer. He bought himself a horse, old Bonesy, and he wanted to get the, uh, get the wagon so he could draw his produce up to streets of Shelburne and, and sell it at the, at the market. But uh, you get the feeling sorry for old Bonesy because he didn't have any company. So then he went and he bought a couple of cows, the Bonesy company. Well, then he overdid it. He had to he had to cut some hay for it. So he then he had to buy a tractor to cut the hay to keep the horse. And after he got the tractor, he had to have the mowing machine and the, the, the rake and a baler all of which he added to his expense, and he had to buy himself a truck to draw it in on. And he had to build himself a barn to keep up all this. <laughs> and all, all the uh, improvements we had didn't live any better than did before. Everything was a family, uh, a family affair. Uh, haying was a total family affair. Not only our family, but uh, we had friends that would come and help us. Sugaring was another uh, family uh, thing. And as the as the years progressed, uh, machinery came along, which uh, you know was supposed to make it easier, but it really didn't. That uh, the years where we were doing pitching hay by hand and doing it with horses, I can remember getting a, a load of hay and then sitting, sitting under the tree and talking and drinking Kool Aid. But as we got equipment, it became more hectic. Where you know, before you would do an acre or two of uh, hay, now you had to do 15, 20 acres of hay. So uh, it became a matter of a mad dash and eating off the tractor. And uh, it, it was a progress in one sense, but it was a total backward step in the sense that you didn't need the children to 
throw hay or, or to do things anymore. Machinery did it for you. Business in the valley was lumbering and sugaring and uh, dairying. There was some produce that was growing. There was potatoes, a lot of potatoes growing in the valley, and we grew string beans and we grew, we grew soldier beans, which is a baking bean. We done pretty wild farming for the first eight or ten years, and then as uh, the equipment began to change and the methods of farming, we found we were going to have to keep investing more and more money. After a while, we realized that uh, we would have to invest more money than what we originally paid for the farm if we continued because we knew that we'd have to buy bulk tanks and combines and redo our stable. So I slowly began, was forced to uh, sell parts of my farm off to development to get enough return to pay the taxes and make a limit. So we uh, started taking skiers as a lodge to help, and on the side I started doing plumbing. Oh, I, I think I can see a, a, uh, a serious beginning of change that came with the ski areas in 1947. started with Mad River Glen. None of us really were wealthy when growing up, but uh, the advent of the skiing business was, a, was another cash crop because there were no lodges built. They came in and built a ski area first with no lodges. So everybody took skiers in the winter for just additional money. Uh, that absorbed a lot of labor that used to work on farms. And of course, farms were going downhill. The timber industry was going downhill. Uh, you couldn't compete with finished lumber from the West and from Canada uh, on a price basis. So I would say the, the beginning of the serious change was the ski business. Between 1945 and 1960, the population of the valley declined as logging and agriculture faltered. When the ski areas led an influx of new capital, though, land values rose at a rate that is still hard to comprehend. In 1986, land in Warren was 500 times as valuable as it had been in 1956. In 1957, Waitsfield had one small real estate office. By 1976, there were 22. Selling off part of the farm became business as usual. As the balance of the valley's economy tipped, so did the balance of the valley's culture. For the first time, native Vermonters found themselves in an uncomfortable minority. Well, I come along the road, and I'm out there trying to get a heifer back in the pasture. The guy turns his car around, comes back, and says, see what your cow did to my car. See what your cow, we never heard that years ago. We've been... Well, I've been farming here, helping father and everybody for, what, 70 years, and I never heard anybody say, uh, see what your cow did to my car. As in the rest of Vermont, Valley residents see a paradox. The influx of newcomers who admire the state's rural qualities threatens the very landscape and culture they want to preserve. The uh, price of property has changed immensely. Uh, people with financial means have come here and they've recognized the beauty of what we have in the community. The sad part about the thing, as, as many of us see it, is that though many people who came here f for a reason, they, they haven't been able to forget what they came from. And you, you see a, a a uh, different philosophy among the people altogether. They talk about the natives and and, and the flatlanders, and uh, not saying that they aren't good people. They're good people, but what they really came here for, what they wanted to maintain, is is being destroyed. I know I run into people who say we liked it better before and well, we don't like the skiers and we don't like this or that development. But uh, when you look at the times we live in and the way of life of people, they really enjoy this. People like to come from Boston or New York or Philadelphia and see the Green Mountains and enjoy what we have here. 
of course, it's not as rustic as it used to be. They like their amenities, and they wouldn't come here if they didn't have all this. And I think we have it all. And we hope we can keep it that way from now on. So we've got to compete with the world. Vermont couldn't stay like it was, not, not live <laughs> in this society. That it was a, a good thing. It turned many farmers that couldn't even pay their taxes into millionaires, property going up like it did. Over, all in all, it is a good thing for Mott. We, as long as the rest of the world is going like that, it, we got to keep up with it. We all say, well, we should like, like it used to be, but it can't be. No way. It's a fast change, and I can remember there was, oh my gosh, there was, there must have been a hundred farms in the valley. Now you can count them all on one hand. I don't know. I, I actually liked it better in 1954 because it was it was a f friendly environment. Not that they aren't friendly now, but there's a difference. There's a different feeling all the time. It, you don't know half the people in town no more. It's 65 percent of the people in town are outsiders. They own the property. Us local people sold it to them. So if they've got the property, they've got a right to vote. So what the heck? They vote their way, they outvote us, but we're to blame. We sold them the property in the first place, so. Yeah. Rupert Blair, Spike Vassar, Edgar Trombley, Jack Smith, George Carpenter, Ed Irish, Lixie Fortna, Earl Long, and Alden Bettis are present and past residents of Vermont's Mad River Valley. The interviews were recorded by Miles B. Smith. This series was produced for the Vermont Folklife Center, Middlebury, by Jane Beck and Ev Grimes. Funding was provided by the Friends of the Mad River and the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Fund. I'm Greg Sharrow. I sold my business in 1980 in New York and then really moved up half the time, spending time in the summer up here, which was fabulous. It was like a whole new world to see how you know, lovely and rich and uh, quiet, peaceful, the whole area was. In the 1980s, the Mad River Valley may have been quiet compared to New York City, but by its own standards, it had undergone an astonishing transformation. The river, which had once played a major role in the economy of the valley, was now a picturesque tourist magnet. Better roads changed the isolated valley towns into a drive-through landscape. Whereas the wealth had originally been in the north end, in the mills of Moortown, now it had migrated south to Warren and Faston, as if the valley had been turned upside down. Even recreation was no longer limited to winter sports. The mountain companies were calling themselves four-season resorts, and recreation included mountain biking, gliding, cricket, golf, and polo. Warren was now known for its architects, Waitsfield for a variety of new entrepreneurial activities, Bob Stiller came across Green Mountain Coffee Roasters in a local restaurant and ended up buying the business. And once again, change ushered in change. As we went to grow the business in the valley, there was a lot of things that I never really thought of there. I mean, it was like a great place to come and relax and rejuvenate and spend time. But to grow a business, we really didn't have the people that were living there that were looking for careers. There weren't a lot of support businesses. There wasn't a lot of space. There wasn't a lot of office space. And finally, when we ran out of space there, we had to. We found something in Waterbury, and that's really how we got there. We just couldn't find any space in Waysfield, and just started next closest town where we could find something. It was always challenging to keep things going. In that, sometimes if it, if there was a nice day, people felt you know this day should not be wasted and they would be off skiing once we had our coffee roaster disappear for a few days because he had to do some house painting. Like Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, many of the new businesses sell their products out of state, introducing still more connections with a broader world. Uh, Mad River Canoe is one of the small businesses we have in Waitsfield and they employ a few people and they ship everything they make outside the state or outside the town anyhow. And, uh, of course, this brings money in. I first came up here to ski. 
so it was after I got married that we looked for land for ski house and decided that uh, it was a good place to put a second home and then ended up because of an accident with a horse and a car ended up staying up here for an extended period of time. Meanwhile, my husband had designed a canoe and a kayak, which we'd used throughout our western trip, and we'd gone off to race, and people were asking about the boat, and we started the business. While very different in uses from earlier years, the Mad River Valley still has economic roots in water. But not everyone in town is in favor of bottling it and selling it, as Virginia Houston realized when she discovered a huge aquifer, a natural underground reservoir, on her land. Anyway, it turns out that it's the largest bedrock aquifer in the Northeast. It's the largest source of spring water in the entire Northeast. It, they conservatively estimate the flow um, to be 1,500 gallons a minute. If the history of the last 40 years has shown Valley residents anything, it's that development always has its price and should be viewed warily. There are two factions who have succeeded in polarizing <laughs> the issue. Mm -hmm. There are a number of people, uh, most of them with a farm background, who feel that uh, zoning is, is an unwarranted government invasion of, of your right to do what you want with the land on which you pay taxes. Uh, there is another class of people who lives close to where the aquifer has been identified, who obviously do not want an increase in traffic on their roads and their highways and dust and smoke and, and that business. They certainly are against it. My own personal view is I think that government ent entities do have a valid function in performing some regulatory process. I don't have too much problem with with reasonable regulation. And extraction of water looks to me to be a super clean industry <laughs> and uh, provides some jobs and creates some value. A lot of it was just, it's my right to do what I want to and no one can tell me. And everybody digs in their heels. And even if they wanted to agree, they wouldn't because <laughs> they don't just don't agree. <laughs> the biggest objection I've heard of is this parade that uh, their kids might get hurt with these trailer trucks. But Virginia has offered to, Miss Houston there has offered to, to fix the road. She's offered to fix that up and help any damage the trucks do to the road, she's willing to pay for it. But people think that it's too dangerous for kids, but kids should be playing in the roads anyway. I think that it used to be when you lived here, you could do what you wanted to do. But now new people move in and they come here because they like it. And now they want to change everything and tell us what we can do. I like Virginia, and I hope that she can do what she wants to. It's her property. After two generations of the most rapid and radical change in its history, change itself seems to have become a force to contend with. Somehow everybody seems to want to find fault with whatever another person wants to do. I mean, we tried to expand Mad River Canoe and just ended up with adjacent landowners or other people fighting about it for really some of the strangest reasons and I mean they built their houses there after we'd started the business after there'd been a canoe manufacturing plant and then to say you don't like it and you don't want it to get bigger and you don't want any traffic on the road it's kind of hard. Well what's happened uh, those that have come here uh, real good people uh, but they sort of want to infringe upon the fact that uh, they too want to share these, these values that we've had with our property. Uh, but uh, many of the people feel that they want to keep it as they like to see it as it was when they come here. In the surveys that we've had, why they, people come to, come to Vermont is the fact that of the green fields and the pastures and so forth. And, and because of the stewardship that was carried out through the farmers on their own without any, uh, any uh, help from, from others, has made Vermont the type of an, a state and the type of an area that people want to come to. And uh, the success of our, of our farming uh, was how well we did do these things that 
uh, made made Vermont beautiful. The sun goes down in the middle of the afternoon in the winter as it always did. <laughs> we are surrounded by the mountains, uh, which contribute to the isolation. I think probably with the strictures of Act 250, you know, no building above 2,500 feet, uh, the mountains will, will continue to stay. And uh, there's, a, there's an awful lot of acres that you can still build houses on without going up that high. I don't see uh, Route 100 being becoming a major highway. Um, I think the isolation will continue. I don't think the the transportation will get a a, a lot easier than it is today, and uh, nor be become a lot harder. So uh, it will it will still be a a pretty super little pocket in which to live. My view. I agree. A lot of people will come and look at us and leave and <laughs> leave their money and that's just fine with me. Keep Vermont green. Mm -hmm. Bob Stiller, Edgar Tremblay, Kay Henry, Virginia Houston, Jack Smith, Judy Smith, Jack Larrow, Jessamine Larrow, and Ed Irish are present and past residents of Vermont's Mad River Valley. The Mad River Valley radio series was produced by the Vermont Folklife Center, Middlebury. The interviews were recorded by Miles B. Smith, with music recording by Charles Eller. The musicians are Dottie Brown Fiddle and Robert Manny Guitar. The production assistant for this series was Amy Louise Barnett. The narration was written by Tim Brooks and recorded by Sam Sanders at Vermont Public Radio. The series was mixed by Jane Pippick at WGBH-FM Boston. Special thanks to John Vosey. Funding was provided by the Friends of the Mad River and the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Fund. The series producer was Ev Grimes. The executive producer was Jane Beck, director of the Vermont Folklife Center. I'm Greg Sherrill.